Okay. Hi, my name is Dr. Julia Britz. I'm a naturopathic doctor and I specialize in mental health. And today I want to talk to you about bioresonance because I love bioresonance. It's the coolest thing ever. And I'll go over a little bit of the history, um, how it works when you might want to use it and how it's different from traditional lab work. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about my story too of how I got into it because I also struggled with mental health disorders. And I think a lot of people with mental health disorders like OCD or anxiety, they want more answers. And I certainly did. So let's jump on it. So bioresonance testing is also called biofeedback or um, bioenergetic testing. I like the term bioresonance because it makes the most sense to me based on how it works. Now, if you haven't heard of it before, it can sound a bit out there. And actually, if you were to Google it, you're going to see things like, oh, it's quackery. Ah. But to be fair, a lot of what you see on the web about naturopathic medicine, it's put in the quackery bank anyway. So a giant whatever there. Um, <laughs> but I, I was first introduced to it um, because I had severe OCD and I was told by my doctors like, oh, we're so sorry. You're not going to get better. But here, um, have some SSRIs and some therapy. And I was like, well, I'll take the therapy, but I don't want to take an SSRI. I was way too afraid of the side effects. So that wasn't going to happen for me. And the therapy was pretty helpful. I did ACT um, or acceptance and commitment therapy. And I'd say it got my symptoms down by maybe 20%, which was huge because at that time I really wasn't functional. I wasn't able to go to school or keep a job. And a lot of my routines took a very, very long time to get through like eight showers a day. And it was just a lot, you know, so I digress. Bioresonance is a type of evaluation or scanning that uses electricity. Now we are electrical beings. Our entire body functions because we have electrical stimulation that allows us our muscles to work. Like you can blink, you know, your heart beats, all that stuff. It's all electrical. So, um, the concept is like, if we can interpret some of the, that electricity, maybe we can find out some information about what's going on with that person on an energetic, um, spiritual, emotional, physiological level. Um, and I love that because as a natural doctor, I really care about what's happening with the person, not just one set of symptoms they may have. So bioresonance testing has to do with the innate intelligence, the innate intelligence. You could think of that as the awareness of the conscious mind. This is different than the subconscious, which can store inaccurate or wrong data. So essentially what happens is a person uh, will either touch the bioenergetic device, or maybe they put their hand on a scanner or hold some cathodes or rods. There's different ones out there. Um, and that device will send electricity through that person. Most people can't feel it because the frequency um, like is pretty low. Um, and then different signatures are sent through the body. Like the one I have sends 150,000 and it's sent through the body looking for resonance. So there maybe this is a signature for a certain type of pathogen. If it finds the exact same electrical signature somewhere in our body and our DNA, it will let me know on the computer. Um, which is just really, really cool. So I had a patient just a few weeks ago. Um, she had pretty low copper is what it looked like on, on my bioresonance scan. And we ran her serum copper. It was also pretty low. And so sometimes and that's where those labs are similar, um, with functional or serum lab testing and bioresonance, you might get similar information. The difference is actually really important though. And I'll get to that in a second. So, um, anyways, the electricity goes to the person and the scan is complete. The information goes back to a computer and then, um, whoever's running it can interpret the data and the data can be very simple or it can be very complex. Um, now it's because a lot of these devices, uh, they kind of range in price and a lot of technology. So some devices are about a hundred bucks and you might get just a few little bits of information. Um, and then other devices are in the thousands of dollars and you might get quite a few lines of data. So it depends on that device. It also depends on how the device is, um, maybe set up with the computer programming. And that's based on the practitioner and what they're, how they want to see it, how they wanted to prioritize that. Because a lot of people ask me, Oh, cool. That sounds really neat. I want one of those scans. Can I get a scan from someone in my area and have that information sent to you? 
Um, and I, I usually tell people it's probably better to have the person doing the scan to interpret it because we all have our own way of analyzing the data. Now that's actually pretty also similar in traditional lab work because think of it like this way. If somebody had uh, low iron levels, right? Low serum iron, one doctor might look at that and go, okay, you've got low iron here, have an iron supplement. Another doctor might look at that and go, oh, wow, well, it's not that low. I wouldn't worry about it. You might just be on your period. Another doctor might look at that and go, oh, wow, it's low. I wonder why. Let's look and see if you've got some, you know, internal bleeding or something. And so we all can take that information, interpret it a little bit differently, and that will actually influence our treatment plan. So same with this, you know, we're getting a whole bunch of different data, but how we interpret it can also be pretty subjective. Now, it's pretty, the other, well, hmm. <laughs> The other way that it's a little bit unique by our residents, that is, is because when some when a doctor is doing traditional lab work, which I love, by the way, um, they're looking for information based on their ego. OK, you have all the symptoms consistent with anemia. Let's run an iron panel and a CBC. And maybe if that doctor has really good sense and experience and intuition, um, we may find what we're looking for in a lab pretty fast, you know, either ruling something in or ruling out. Um, however, if that ego takes us down maybe the wrong path, then it might mean that person has to stay sick a lot longer because we haven't really found the answer yet. Whereas with bioresonance testing, I'm not actually requesting any data. I'm not saying, hey, show me the iron information. I really can't because all the information that comes back to me on my computer is based on that person's bio based on their resonating information. So when that electricity goes through and they and maybe there's a resonating data found, that information goes back to the computer. So I don't request it. It just whatever is found is found and I see it all together. Um, so it's a little bit different. And that's why it's in a way you could kind of think of it kind of like muscle testing in the sense that we're sort of asking the body, like, how do you feel about things? Um, the difference I would say between that is that with a lot of people doing muscle testing, which I mean, I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying that, you know, there's potentially some bias there because if, if that practitioner sees the whatever they're testing on the person and then they check them, yeah, you, like, you have a bias. There's going to be something there, no matter how hard you try not to, because you simply know what it is. And historically, you know, it was actually created by, well, hmm, there's lots of them that are created by different people, but I think we can attribute a lot of credit to Dr. Vohl. Um, Dr. Vohl was a German physician, um, and he thought right around 1950, hey, um, maybe uh, medicine could be better. Um, kind of not happy with how it was going. And a lot had changed in Europe and the U.S. after 1910. And you can thank the Flexner Report, so Google that one. So what happened was after the Flexner Report had come out, um, the idea about how to change medical education in the U.S. really began. Now, it, there's some good and bad things. Um, before um, the revamp of medical education and colleges happened, there really wasn't any sort of standardized you know, form of teaching. So some schools were really great and some schools were really not great. Um, so that was valiant, honorable. Um, the thing that wasn't so good was the fact that um, the group that was looking at this information said, you know what, like we don't want chiropractic anymore, no more naturopathic, no more midwifery, out with the drugless healers, that's what they called them. Um, we only want pharmacology and surgery. Boom. And you still see that today that medical schools, there's a predominant focus on pharmacology and surgery. Um, which to me is quite unfortunate because all these modalities can be helpful at different times and severing those, um, types of things into, you know, Western medicine and alternative medicine, it's, it can create a division where, um, you know, it's easy for people to look down on the other, when in reality they can work and often work very well together. So back to Dr. Vol. Um, he was trained in acupuncture and the meridians of the body and also homeopathy. So these are very different ways of looking at the energetic systems besides looking at just, you know, physiological markers in the blood. And he used um, a lot of the information with an ometer to figure out how do we map out and it's constantly evolving even today. How do we map out 
um, any imbalances in the energetic field of a person, either spiritual, mental, emotional, or physiological. So what this might look like in clinical practice. Um, okay, so I had a patient uh, a few weeks ago and she said, oh, you know, and she's a teenager. And so she and her mom were there. She had pretty severe OCD, Crohn's, IBS, um, headaches, um, and some other minor symptoms. But those were the primary ones that came to see me for. So we ran by a residence and looked like she had quite a few strep titers in her brain. Um, I saw that her cerebral spinal fluid was not flowing very well. There was an obstruction, um, at least a mild one. Looked like she had a concussion. Um, I saw a bunch of foods that were showing sensitivity to her chemistry at this time. Um, so I asked, hey mom, she have any kind of a concussion? Yeah, oh, she had a, a concussion a couple years ago playing basketball. Okay, got it. And I mean, you can see um, blood markers for concussion, you know, and you can actually use that to sort of predict when the concussion probably was. I've seen that in athletes before. You know, I'll look and say, hey, this looks like you had a concussion about like maybe three, four years ago. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. There's uh, stages of inflammation the brain goes through and it's not always quick to heal in that way. So, okay, now now we kind of see what I think might be going on. So I, um, you know, I was like, hey, I want you to go see, you know, a body worker to see if we can work on, you know, what's going on with your neck. Um, see if we can clear up some of that, you know, circulation issue going on there with the, the CSF. And uh, let's work on the inflammation of your brain. Let's work on the concussion stuff um, and get those food sensitivities, foods out, you know. So um, anyways, worked on that. And lo and behold, her OCD starts to improve. And um, I think it's, a, it's important as a story because there's, it's so easy to say, oh, what supplements are good for OCD, you know? But in reality, if I'd given her any of those supplements that affected serotonin or GABA or whatever, I would be missing the point because her problem isn't based on neurotransmission. So it's, and that's why I love Byrosent so much is because I wanna to get to the root cause and figure out why is this stuff happening? Because it can make a bigger dent on this. And that was definitely true for me. That's why I got into this because when I had first used Bioresonance, um, I had super, super severe OCD, anxiety, depression, um, self-harm, um, I had a really, really bad PMS, horrible insomnia, all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, and once, you know, she tells me, Hey, I don't know that we can get rid of the OCD entirely, but let's just get your body back in balance. And then let's see what clears up. And lo and behold, a month later, it's like a 180. And it's to the point where people did not believe I had OCD because I had gotten so much better. Only the people that knew me back then really understood what it was like for me. Um, and that's why I got into this. Cause I was like, you know, I have to be a doctor and do this because this, it's just so much more individual. It's so cool. Um, and here we are. Another thing to note is that it's not the same as a rife coil. So we use electricity in a lot of amazing healing ways today. So we can use ultrasound to deal with some pain, can, pain issues as well as for imaging. Um, we can use electrostim to, you know, treat muscle issues or pain or even stimulate uh, certain types of hearing loss. Um, we can even get a heart to come back and start beating again. So electricity can be pretty freaking magical, honestly. Um, but it's not the same as a Rife coil. Um, Rife is a very different type of tool. Um, and that's meant to be more of a treatment device, um, something completely different. And of course, if you are interested in bioresonance, please follow me on Instagram. I do try to release as much information as I can about it because it's really freaking cool.